Hello everyone. Our presentation today is titled Political Socialization and Political Culture. And here we're trying to um, understand what these concepts mean. You know, what does political socialization mean? What does political culture mean? And how are they related or or how do they relate? You know, how do they influence one another, as the case may be. Alright? So that's, that's what we're trying to understand, or that's the purpose of this um, presentation, all right? Now, political socialization and culture are said to be two essential features or characteristics of, um, that contribute to the kind of politics in any society. So um, if, you, if you want to understand what kind of politics goes on in a particular society, it's important to understand what is the nature of political socialization in such a society, you know, what is the political culture of that society? That will help us understand the kind of politics that goes on. All right. Now, even though these are two concepts, two separate, entirely different concepts, you know, they are also concepts that are mutually reinforcing, just like we talked about leadership and followership. You know, these two concepts are very highly related and they influence one another as well. Uh, political culture is said to be a reflection of the extent um, of socialization that takes place in a society. So uh, the socialization of a society, and we'll find out what socialization means in a couple of minutes, you know, in the, pre in the subsequent slides, but the, the extent or the level of socialization determines what kind of culture is in place. All right? Uh, so, so political socialization is, is basically a means to an end, you know, and the end in this case being uh, the culture that results or that emanates out of the process of, social, of socialization. Socialization is a process that spans over a period, a long period of time, you know, and um, the consequence or the result of that process is the culture that emerges at the end of the day. All right. Um, political culture is said to be dynamic. It's not, it's not some, something that is static, so it can change. You know, the culture can, can be this today uh, and then tomorrow it is, it is that because of certain changes or certain, um, certain emphasis that have been made in society on certain values or norms or principles. So culture changes, culture changes. And of course, just like we know, our, our cultural behavior too um, changes depending on society that we live in. You know, those, those who have lived in the rural society for a long time, when they get to the city, to the urban areas, their, their behavior changes as well. You know, they, they, they experience, experience a culture shift or their culture um, undergoes some kind of transformation or um, change, you know, basically. All right, so culture is not something that is static. It's not something that is static. It's a very dynamic phenomenon. And that is also applicable for political culture. You can learn it, you can unlearn it, you can relearn it, all right? Um, so that, that describes the nature um, of culture. And of course, that depends also largely on the kind of socialization that is um, in place, all right? Now, what, what does political culture mean? You know, um, of course, we cannot emphasize or we cannot overemphasize, rather, the fact that concepts don't have one meaning. Social science concepts have multiple meanings. You know, we cannot overemphasize that fact. And so this is another concept that has a variety of meanings. But even from our knowledge of culture, you know, we know that culture is a way of life of a people, traditionally defining that. All right. Now, how do we define political culture? Um, so one of the, the, the very widely used definitions is the one provided by Armand um, and Weber, you know, where they say uh, the political culture uh, are, are the patterns of individual orientations, the attitudes of people towards political system, and its various parts, as well as the role of the individual in the political system. So three things are at play here. The political orientation of the individual, the attitude of the individual towards the system and the role of the individual in the political system. You know, those are, those are three indices, ingredients that constitute political culture. The orientation of the individual, the attitude of the individual, 
and of course the role of the individual in the system. Now you will agree with me that the orientation of an individual determines what their attitude will be. You know, their their philosophy, their perspective will determine what how they will behave, you know, how they would act or react in certain situations. And of course, that also determines their role, you know, within the system. So all of these three are also very, very connected together. So political culture consists commonly uh, consists of commonly shared goals and accepted rules of politics within a society. You know, what are those goals, those values, those rules that are commonly shared and accepted, you know, that everybody um, subscribes to, to a very large extent? And you know, that is what we refer to as culture, political culture. So essentially, um, political culture are the styles, the values, the norms, the emotions, the beliefs, you know, attachments that prevail among people in a society, all right? What, what norms are prevalent? What values, political values are prevalent? What, um, what um, rules are prevalent? What emotions, what belief systems are prevalent? You know, what kind of attachments are prevalent in this kind of society? Those are things that determine what the culture of that political society would be, all right? Uh, so that is what political culture is. Okay, um, the values, the style, the beliefs, the attachments, emotional attachment, the norms that are prevalent in the society that people hold, you know, the commonly shared and accepted values and, and norms, you know, our rules. Those are what political culture is. All right. Now, political culture refers, of course, we've talked about orientation. You know, we said that three things determine culture, the people's orientation, the attitude of the people, and of course, their role. Now, it's important to talk about what orientation, you know, what people's orientation mean, all right? How, how the people perceive um, political objects, you know? So their orientation could either be cognitive, people could have knowledge, awareness, or belief about uh, a political system. You know, that's the, the cognitive orientation, uh, the amount of knowledge, the amount of um, awareness that people have about the system, all right? The effective orientation are the feelings, the emotions, you know, um, the way people feel about the political system. Now, feelings are not necessarily a consequence of knowledge. You might not know about something, you might not have detailed information about something, but you have a feeling, you know, you have some kind of disposition, emotional disposition towards that thing. So effective orientation are the feelings, you know, the emotions that people have towards the political system. Remember that cognitive uh, is, has to do with knowledge, the level of how aware, how informed are the people about the political system. Effective has to do with emotions, feelings, while evaluative are people's judgments. Now, of course, people don't need to know about anything before they can pass judgment, you know, and of course, that is, that is very common. People just, you know, would give their own opinion about whatever it is that goes on within the political society without understanding the issues involved in why those things have occurred, how they played out, you know, and so on and so forth. All right. So these are three kinds of orientation that people have about the political system. And this orientation determines how they behave as well. It determines their attitude. So if people are well knowledgeable, if people are well aware and informed about the political system, it informs how they behave. If people just have an emotional attachment, you know, just they, they just they just have a feeling, they just have uh, how people feel about the political system also determines how they behave. You know, the judgments that people have or the people make about certain incidents or certain leaders, certain policies also determine how they behave. So it's important for us to understand what orientation means because we said that according to Armand and Weber, political culture has to do with, you know, people's orientation towards political objects, how this orientation affects the attitude of people in the political system and the role of the people as well within the political system. So these are what orientation means. They can either be cognitive orientation, people can either have effective orientation, or people can have evaluative orientation, you know. And sometimes um, people can have all three kinds of orientation. 
people can have cognitive, people can be aware, people can be emotional, you know, people can also be evaluative. So whether some, one, two, or all three of these, you know, eventually um, influences how people behave in, in the political system. Now, there are three major types of political culture still proposed by Armand and Weber in the book titled The Civic Culture, published in 1963. They proposed three types of political culture, you know, and of course, individuals um, manifest this, you know, manifest either of these types of political culture at every point in time. There's, there's a parochial culture. And here, the people have, have a limited, in this kind of culture, people have a limited knowledge you know, about the political system. Um, of course, they are just aware of what's going on within their immediate local environment, the, perhaps their neighborhood, their community, you know. Um, they have a knowledge of what's going on in their immediate neighborhood. But beyond that, they don't know anything else about the political system and they are not involved, you know. Um, um, in, their, in, 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 the, in, the, in the politics that's going on around them. So here, politics is dominated um, by ethnic or primordial sentiments. You know, people are more inclined to their ethnicity or their ethnic groups. People are more inclined to their, their family ties, you know, and they're not really interested in politics, basically. And of course, they don't have any significant expectations, too, from the political leaders or from the political system. Because they're not contributing so much. And they're, not, they're not contributing, they're not interested basically um, in, the, in the political. Um, not, not necessarily they're not interested, they're, they're not knowledgeable about. And of course, if they're not knowledgeable, they're not able to participate actively. You know? And sometimes, of course, their interest level might also lead them not to be knowledgeable or to, be, to, to participate. So it is all of these uh, put together. So, Basically, what we're saying is that the parochial culture is one where people are not informed about their political system. You know, all they know is what goes on around them in the immediate environment. You know, people are more um, connected to their ethnic groups or to their family ties, and there's really no expectation from government. That's how that's how you read a parochial culture. The subject culture is one where people are informed about government. You know, they, they are knowledgeable about government programs and policies, you know, and laws. But they don't play any active part in the formation of these, of these laws, you know, or how the laws are implemented. They don't play any active part in influencing the kind of laws that are made. But of course, they are knowledgeable about the laws, you know, but they don't participate. So they're, they're, just, they're just subject. Um, there's a subject culture. That's when you say there's a subject culture in place. People know about politics, people are informed, but they don't do so much to influence the political process. You know, they don't do so much to influence, they're not, they're not so involved, even though they are informed and aware. They're not so involved. In the parochial, they're not informed, they're not aware, and they're not involved. They don't expect anything significant. All right? In the subject, they are informed sufficiently, but they're not involved. All right, and the third, the third type is the participant culture. Here, people are informed sufficiently. You know, they are involved. They influence how policies are made. You know, how policies are implemented, and of course, they have very high expectations from from the political process too, because they are very, very much involved in the process of politics. All right, so these are three um, types of political culture that exist. Now, like we said, no culture is, is static. The culture is not static. So people can have, uh, a society can have a parochial culture today. And of course, in a few months' time, that culture uh, moves, you know, to a subject culture. And over time, it becomes, you know, there exists a participant culture in such a society. So it, de it depends on the level of, so of socialization. It depends on the level of, of enlightenment, on the level of, awareness that people have about the political process okay um so culture is not static societies can move from you know from one type of culture to another and of course societies can also move from participant culture to subject you know depending on the circumstances that are at play in such a society all right now how do you 
um, know what kind of culture is in place. What are the elements of political culture? You know, how do you know? How do you identify what kind of culture is in place in a society? So the key contents of political culture include the level of trust or distrust in government. You know, if people trust government uh, sufficiently, then of course they will be participants. You know, they 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 want to get involved in what is going on. All right. If people distrust the government, then there's most likely that there might be a subject culture. There, are people might be aware, but they might not be interested, or people, or even or even a parochial culture. All right. The second, the second content or, or ingredient is the level of tolerance, you know, and interpersonal cooperation among members in society. So how tolerant are people of their fellow citizens? You know, um, do, you, do you tolerate the diversity, the fact that the other person is Igbo or is from a separate ethnic group from you? You know, do you tolerate that the other person practices a separate religion from yours? So how tolerant? Are the members are the citizens within the state you know how is what is the level of interpersonal relationship or connection that people have with one another do people speak with one voice within the system that also tells you what kind of culture is in place what is the level of loyalty or attachment of citizens to the political system are citizens attached or loyal to the system the citizens want to uphold the integrity of the system that also gives you an idea of what kind of culture is in place in that society. What is citizens' attitudes towards the government in power? Do citizens respect the government in power? Are citizens loyal to the government in power? Do citizens love the government in power? You know, that will also give you a kind of idea about the culture that is in place. Citizens' sense of their own involvement in decision-making. Do people feel that they are involved, young, old everyone is involved in the process of decision making you know or do people feel that they are they are excluded from the process of making decisions perhaps because of their ethnic group or because of their religion or because of their culture you know or because of their age or whatever it is or their background if they feel excluded then of course it affects the kind of culture that is in place so these are some of the ingredients with which you can measure you know identify what kind of political culture exists within a society, whether it is parochial, whether it is subject, or whether it is participant. Okay? Um, these are some of the other dynamics of political culture. We have mentioned that um, the prevalence of a particular culture, type of culture, you know, um, in a state determines the culture um, the, no, the prevalence of, the, of a particular type of culture in a state determines the political culture of the state. So uh, if, 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 of course, you have the participant culture prevalent, you know, in the state, then, of course, it means that um, the political culture of the state is, 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 uh, is parochial, you know, depending on the culture that is prevalent. Now, what this means is that in a, in a political system, not everyone would have the same culture. So you might have some people might be parochial, some people in the political system might be subject, might have a subject culture, some other people might have a participant culture. You know, so you might have these three types of culture existing in various sections of one political system. All right, but there must be one of these three types of culture that is prevalent. So more people might be either parochial or subject or participant, depending. On the, on the number of such people compared to others who are not in that class. So what we're saying is that the prevalent culture is the political culture of that system. So for instance, in, Nigerian, in the Nigerian state, we know that not so many people are participants or have a participant culture, at least in, in the past. We have not had so many people who are, who are participants in the, in the government. And of course, not so many people are also parochial, but we have, we have people who are parochial, who are not really aware of politics beyond their immediate environment and are not even interested. We have those who are participants who go to elections, who are very vocal about political issues and who participate in decision making and all of that. But the majority of Nigerians are subject. 
they are aware but they are really not participating you know for reasons that are various that are varied all right so the prevalent culture in nigeria appears to be the subject culture and that is that can be said to be the culture the political culture of the nigerian state it doesn't mean that the subject culture or that the participant culture rather is absent or that the parochial culture is absent all it just means is that the subject culture is prevalent you're right it's more pronounced than these other two types of political culture so that's what this first point is saying and even though you might have all three cultures existing in a particular society or a particular political system one of them will be prevalent and so the political culture of that society is the culture that is most prevalent that is most dominant among these three types all right uh, no state particularly especially in africa has a homogeneous culture you know so like we have said before um states have a particular state can have all three types of cultures uh, of culture within within such a state and the political culture is mostly fragmented throughout the state with several subcultures existing you know alongside the dominant culture so the dominant culture in nigeria is the subject culture but in some sections of the of the state perhaps in the in the well enlightened areas you know in the in the capital city um people are participants people are involved people are aware you know in the rural areas people are not really aware they're not they're not really interested you know so other types of culture exist but predominantly um, the subject culture prevails a relatively homogeneous political culture is necessary to foster development so for development to occur um people must have one one culture must be dominant to the extent that you know a, a very good number or a very good representation of the of the political system practices that dominant culture so for instance in nigeria for political development to occur you know the nigerian citizens must move from the from the subject um political culture to the participant culture and of course more people must must become participants you know if development is going to occur and of course the participant culture is is the most suitable culture um for any progressive society people must get involved people must go to the ballot to uh, must go to the polling booths to cast their votes people must make comments on policy issues when they have the when they have the opportunity to you know and so on and so forth so the participant culture is the most um is the most suitable for any progressive society but of course everybody or as 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 much as possible the citizens in a political system must subscribe to that participant culture you know in order to have a homogeneous culture if development is to be experienced within such a political system all right now let's move to socialization um, political socialization we have defined what culture is we said the, the the political orientation of people you know how it affects their behavior or their attitudes and of course the role they play in society as well now what is political socialization this is described as a way in which societies transfer political culture from one generation to another so how does a society transfer the norms the values the style the emotions the beliefs that are prevalent in such a society from one generation to another that's what socialization entails the transfer of such values and norms from generation a to b all right uh, so socialization is an individual's acquisition of course the process of acquiring um attitudes that are relevant for such a political system or political group or for certain political processes all right it helps to preserve norms and institutions and it's, it can also be a vehicle for social change you know political socialization can be a vehicle for social change like what is going on now in nigeria you know the social media is socializing people so much that people are getting so involved in the political process you know asking for a reform of police of the police force asking for an end to police brutality you know that is a consequence of socialization all right so it can also be a tool a vehicle for social change for political change all right essentially socialization is a process of learning social patterns or social norms 
from one's environment. So how do you learn? How do you subscribe to? You know, how do you decide what values, what norms you subscribe to? That is what uh, comes out of the process of socialization. All right. Now, now this process of social of socialization gives birth to political behavior. Okay, so this is another concept that is coming in now, political behavior. All right. When people are socialized, their socialization, like we said, affects their behavior. And so political behavior is another very, very interesting concept. But of course, it's not part of our discussion here, even though it is related. You know, so social socialization gives birth to behavior. And the behavior over time is what constitutes the culture of such a society. So you see the link between these three, these three concepts. All right. There are two major methods of socialization. There's the direct socialization and there's the indirect socialization. Now, what do we mean by direct socialization? Direct socialization has to do with the formal methods that are involved in consciously learning you know, certain social norms, social values, you know, those formal methods of learning values and norms in society are what we mean by direct socialization. You know, of course, it can also occur by conscious imitation of other people's behavior, you know, role modeling. There are certain political figures that, that one can like, admire within a political system, and they consciously are trying to model their lives or their behavior after such a political figure or individual or groups of individuals, you know. So that conscious effort to model, to pattern your behavior after that of others, that conscious effort can also be regarded as direct socialization, all right? So formal training given by parents, given by teachers, given by peer group, given by certain political organizations, political parties, you know, interest groups, given by religious organizations as well. All of those formal training, seminars that are, that are organized, webinars that are held, you know, Zoom meetings that are held, online classes that are held, all of those formal training settings, you know, are direct, are methods of direct socialization. All right? Uh, so individuals can also have certain experiences, political experiences that directly, you know, impact how they behave, you know, which of course can also constitute direct socialization. So that's, that's, that's one method of political socialization. It can be direct. It can also be indirect. So direct has to do with conscious, you know, conscious effort, consciously, you know, um, organizing programs that people can formally learn about social norms, about social values, about social ethics, about certain belief system, and what have you, about the political system. All right? But indirect socialization deals with an unconscious learning of skill, you know, of roles, of attitudes, without knowing it. So unconsciously acquiring such skills, you know, assuming such roles, um, subscribing to certain attitudes without necessarily knowing that you are that you are learning these things that's what indirect socialization is all right it also refers to acquisition of non-political values now there are some values that we acquire um, in the course of our interaction with people you know certain values perhaps like respect for the other person tolerance of people's of people's differences of our different of i mean our differences with with other people tolerating people tolerating their religion you know, all of those we learn, they are not necessarily political values. But are they important for the political system? The answer is yes. All right. So acquisition of these non-political values that are also or that have some influence on the political um, on political behavior, which can also be regarded as indirect socialization. All right. Um, the fact that you must respect your elders, you must speak politely to people. Those are not necessarily political values, but they have an influence on our political behavior. You know, so that is also an indirect method of socialization. Transfer of political values by interpersonal relationship. You know, as sometimes you hold just informal conversations within a group of friends, you know, or at an eatery. And as people, as, as people are expressing their own views about politics, 
you know, you might begin to subscribe unconsciously to the views that others are expressing, you know, and so you're subscribing to, to certain values, certain norms without knowing it, unconsciously you're subscribing to those norms. And of course, you are doing that because you're having this kind of interaction or relationship with your peers or with, you know, just in the forum, you are, you are overhearing some discussions on, on radio or TV and so on and so forth. So these are two methods of socialization. It can be either direct or indirect, all right? And we have explained what direct and indirect socialization um, mean. Now, the last thing we we'll talk about are the agents of socialization. There are five agents, major agents of socialization. And the family is said to be the first agent because, of course, life begins at the family. You know, and so um, personal development, non-political values, all of these are learned at the family. And sometimes the family can also be deliberate in giving direct socialization. You know, parents can directly... Uh, inform, educate their children about the political system, you know, and provide some kind of direct socialization, passing down values from themselves to the children, you know, as the case may be. So the family structure is a very crucial um, element of socialization. If the structure of the family is not, it's not good enough, you know, to socialize the people, the, the children, then it means that the children have missed out, you know, on that um, on the benefits of that agent, which is the family. All right, the next one is the school. And of course, in the school, you have the, the curriculum, you have the classroom rituals, you know, like devotionals that we do in class, certain um, questions that people ask in class, the level of interaction in the class. All of these are rituals that can help to pass on certain values from the teacher to the student, or even from one student to another, you know, during during discussions in class, during team discussions, students a, students in a team might be having a conversation, and um, as as they converse, values are transferred, you know, without even the teacher um, being involved. So students can transfer values to other students. The teacher also can transfer to to students, as the case may be, depending on the classroom environment. Extracurricular activities, you know, um, all of these are certain elements. Of the school that help to transfer values from um, or among members within that, that 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 environment, that school environment, all right. Whether from teacher to student, or from student to to student, you know, as the case may be. The church is another agent, you know, and of course, like I mentioned before, the church must be conscious, you know, in in providing or in providing socialization political socialization for its members. And of course, there are also some non-political values that people pick up, you know, from their interactions in the church over time that also have some influence on their political behavior, as we have said about indirect um, socialization. The mass media, um, of course, television, radios, magazines, social media, all of these are very important tools of socialization. Um, members of peer group, you know, are also... Um, also a, a, an agent of socialization, all right? Either because they share similar status, similar age, similar, similar experience, then the similar space. You know, people have an influence on, on their peers as much as possible. And so these are the agents of socialization that exist. Remember, we have, we have said that socialization is what results in political behavior. And then, of course, the behavior of people over time um, translates to a culture in a, in a system, all right? So for the culture to be progressive, there has to be adequate socialization. There has to be appropriate behavior that will translate into a progressive participant culture, you know, that would result in development within society. In conclusion, we have said that political culture, political socialization, and political behavior are three concepts that are very you know, that are very important in the political system and, of course, for political development. All right, we have talked about the relationship between the three, how socialization leads to the behavior, which in turn eventually leads to the culture. All right, we have talked about the fact that um, behavior, of course, culture, 
which of course is linked to, to behavior which is linked to culture it's not static right people can learn values people can unlearn values and as they as they as they interact you know culture can also change from subject to participant to parochial depending on what the on what the issues involved in such a political system are so so, so political culture is not static political behavior is not static you know but political socialization of course are the values the norms that must be transferred you know from one um, from one generation to another all right and um, of course we have mentioned that political socialization is a process you know and it is said to begin at the cradle when when someone is born you know we have said that the family is the first agent so that's where socialization begins at the family and of course it goes on socialization continues until life you know ceases so it starts from the cradle and it ends in the grave all the while in between the cradle and the grave political socialization is going on you know so so it's a process that that spans for an entire lifetime basically all right we have talked about the fact that the participant culture is the most ideal culture for any progressive society and of course um, it is also based on appropriate you know adequate genuine socialization you know by all the agents working together to ensure that uh, individuals and groups are properly socialized with the right values with the right norms with the right rules with the right non-political values too that can help in fostering a in fostering an appropriate political behavior that will lead to participant culture uh, so this is where we're going to stop the presentation for today i hope that this has been helpful if you have questions or comments certainly we can continue the conversation in the meantime thank you so much for listening